such a pleasure to be here this morning. Ko Julia Grace Toku Ingoa, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Koto Katoa. Ladies, who was here last night? Yes, we had a good time. We had to bring in extra chairs, and that's always a good sign, right? Um, there are some things that I sung last night that I won't be singing this morning. Um, just putting it out there. And I also had a wardrobe malfunction yesterday, which we won't mention either. But it's actually really lovely to speak to the men this morning as well. Welcome. I love speaking to women. I also equally love speaking to men. But men can be a bit of a tough crowd. Because the ladies, like, they laugh and they get in there. So thank you if you smile at me, make me feel a bit encouraged with your body language. I do appreciate that. Um, once I was speaking at a... Uh, a gig in Nelson, and I was sitting on stage, and it wasn't lovely like this. We didn't have the beautiful lights and, and things. It was dry, fluorescent lighting, and I was kind of eye to eye with this guy who was sitting in the front row. He's probably about as far away as you are from there from me. And I sang a song, and during my song, he gave me what I can only refer to as the death stare. <laughs> you know that look? That just like eyeing me up, he had a big beard and that kind of Nelson thing going on, and I was really intimidated, but I was trying to keep it calm because, of course, we look like we know what we're doing. So on the surface, I'm smiling and singing. Inside, I'm just thinking, oh, he hates me. I don't know what I've done wrong, but he hates me. <laughs> at the end of the service, we had a CD table at the back, and uh, I saw him making a beeline for me. And as he came closer, I thought, I don't know what it is about me he doesn't like, but I have a feeling I'm about to find out. <laughs> as he came closer to the table, I noticed something interesting. He had a little tear running down the side of his face. And he came up to me and he goes, Julia, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I was like, bro, a little bit of feedback during the song would have been super, super helpful. <laughs> but thanks for telling me now. So if you've cracked a smile already, I do appreciate it very much. This morning is going to be very, very practical. My topic around mental health is around being kind to your mind. And I'm a firm believer in putting our faith in action. One of my favorite scriptures in James 2 verse 26 that says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. One of the things I respect the most about the Salvation Army movement is that you put your money where your mouth is. You put your faith into action in the community, and I absolutely love that. Even watching the video there of seeing uh, women around the world being affected by the ministry of Salvation Army, well done, love it. So today is going to be practical. Is that okay? Because I reckon if, if we think of our faith as being one part of our walk and our works as being the other, it's kind of two legs. So as we go through, we've got our faith and our works, and our faith, and our works. And when it comes to our mental health and mental well-being, we do have the side of our faith, but it's also really important that we put what we learn into practice. Amen? Yeah. Now, this came into stark realisation for me that you've got to actually do something about life. I found myself as a single mum at 40 years old, and I was absolutely of the opinion that I had another good marriage in me. Now, don't judge me, the first husband left, I had nothing to do with it, uh, but I was really keen to be married again, and I realised that if I wanted to find a new husband, I couldn't just sit at home. Because I came to the conclusion that if I sat at home and I just prayed for the man of my dreams to turn up at my doorstep and knock on the door, I was going to have to be prepared to marry a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> <laughs> And with the greatest of respect, that's just not my jam. Like, it's not my thing. And like, totally cool. I had to actually get out there and do something. So today we're going to talk about our faith, but we're also, my challenge to you is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about what you learn today when it comes to your mental well-being? So that's a little bit about me, as my journey has been a really interesting one. At age 40, I found myself in that situation, and I found myself dealing with some mental and emotional pressures that I really hadn't been prepared for. I was brought up in the church, and I was brought up with an underlying feeling that if I made all the right decisions, I'd get all the right results. And I do believe that partially to be true, because the choices we make do, to a certain degree, predict what comes next. But I think I could honestly say that every person in this room would be able to tell me about a moment in which something happened to them, around them, or for them that was totally outside of their expectation. Would I be right? Yeah. 
A meteorite has come and landed in your life. Could be relationally, financially, maybe to do with your health or something. Something has happened to us all. And for me, that meteorite was the end of my family, the end of my marriage. And I found myself dealing with a bunch of stresses and pressures in my life that I was actually really unprepared for. Stress turned to pressure, turned to anxiety, turned to burnout, turned to panic attacks, and eventually to clinical depression. And I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, this has been a deeply humbling experience. I like to say my life is like a long series of getting knocked off my high horse and getting back on progressively smaller horses. And right now, I'm saddling up a chihuahua <laughs> as I deal with and manage some things around my mental health. But this morning, I want to talk to you about some of the practical things that go with it. We're going to do a bit of a recap, but first of all, I want to check in with you, see how you're going. Ladies, you know where we're going? It's time for our Chihuahua check-in. Have a talk to the person next to you and decide which Chihuahua you are today. All right, have a chat. (coughs) 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 Is she a two? She changed today. All righty. Okay, what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to get you to do me a little favour. There's so many of you I'm going to have to video instead of take a selfie. When, I'm going to say three, two, one, and when I say go, I want you to hold up the finger of the number of which chihuahua you are. I'm going to take a little selfie if you will bear with me, and I'm going to scroll along like that. And let me know, um, and as I... Say go, can you yell out Chihuahua? You ready? Three, two, one, Chihuahua! Oh, that was a bit quiet. Yes, who was that? <laughs> I love that person. Yeah, thank you. I knew you had my back. I had a feeling. All right, who's, who's feeling about number one? Happy, just good to be here. Life is good, fantastic. All right, two, not, one, not quite sure. I don't really want to be here. <laughs> Maybe. I'm not sure why I'm here or just not quite sure. Who's the number three? Every teenager. Put your hand up. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, whatever. Yeah, no. Four, four, four. I call this dazed and confused. Life feels a little bit like this at the moment, doesn't it? We often wake up feeling number four. Five. That'll be us this afternoon. Yeah. Actually, probably this is the teenagers, to be honest. <laughs> Wish I was asleep. And underneath it all, aren't we all a number six? Absolutely fabulous. All right, I'm going to dive over to your piano because I have no reason, but apart from the fact that when there is a grand piano in the room, you have to play it, right? Because why would I not? Because it's so beautiful. And I thought I would share with you this morning um, a song that's become sort of part of my journey during that period of time. Uh, It's my grandma's favourite hymn. I had the privilege a number of years ago when I was sort of beginning this period of time of recording a project of mine and my grandma's favourite hymns. And I picked this hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And um, the thing I love about this song is it doesn't say it is well with my finances (laughs) or it is well with my health or it is well with my relationships. It simply says it is well with my soul. And you know, so many days we wake up in the morning and we cannot control what's going on around us. We can't control other people's decisions. We can't control the weather. We can't control the Muppets on the road. (laughs) We can't control the things that are happening in our environment, but we can control our response to them. We can still decide, as the writer of this hymn, Horatio Spafford, said, even in the middle of the storm, we can still decide to declare that it is well with my soul. So this is uh, is my version of the song. I'm just going to double check that this is all go. One, two. Beautiful. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my Lord you have taught me to say, it is well. It 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Always that awkward moment in church, eh? Like, do you clap, do you not? Because I go to all different flavours and different people do things differently. And you go to Pentecostal churches, they started clapping earlier and they haven't stopped, so it's quite convenient, just kind of <laughs> rolls its way through, but all good. All right, let's have a little recap about what we talked about yesterday. We talked about getting yourself a jelly buddy. And I handed out some little cards. Has anyone who's grabbed one of these already? I've got lots of those. I know we've got some people who've taken them out. Talked about the concept of creating somebody in your world who you can rely on on a wobbly day. And the thing about having a jelly buddy is that it doesn't mean that they are your counsellor. It doesn't mean they're your psychologist and suddenly they're responsible for your mental health. What it means is they are there for you to help you on your wobbly days. I said to the ladies last night, our jelly buddies are people who can step in and if you answer them back with, they say, hi, how are you? And you just say, good, and can I come around? No, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know how we do that thing when we say we're fine when we're not? You know? If you're married men, if your wife is looking grumpy and you say, how are you? And she says, I'm fine. <laughs> She's not fine. You need to ask more questions. You need to read the body language. <laughs> so I say to my, buddy, my jelly buddies, if you get out of me just this response of I'm fine, I'm good, you have permission to keep, che to keep checking. You have permission to keep pushing a little bit. You're the one that's allowed to turn up to my house. I said, if you turn up to my house and I don't answer the door, break a window. And if the cops turn up, Show them your jelly buddy cards. <laughs> I guarantee this will stand up in a court of law. <laughs> I do not guarantee this will stand up in a court of law, by the way. Please don't try it. My, my message today is about on the good days, preparing for the wobbly days and getting ready. So we talked a bit about that last night. We also went through a little bit of my understanding of mental health issues, is that mental wellness issues are rum. They are reasonable, they're universal, and they are manageable. First of all, they make sense. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Mental wellness issues are a reasonable response of the body to the pressures of life. We should not be surprised when our brain tells us too much information, overstimulated, I'm going to start giving you some signals that you need to start listening to. I encourage people, rather than fighting their brain, trying to cast out their brain, trying to dampen down the responses of their brain, to actually listen and say, what is it that my body is trying to tell me? 
God has created us so that our body gives us signals and we're really good at not listening to them. So mental health issues are a reasonable response of the body to the pressures of life. Secondly, universal, we are all on a wellness spectrum. Now there's someone in every room who's like, oh, I'm sick of talking about mental health, mental wellness. I don't need to talk about wellness, Julia. I'm really well. Well, you can always get weller. Because you can tell a weller woman by the way she I knew you were going to help me out, by the way she wears her hair. And of course, in the wonderful words of Rachel Hunter, it won't happen overnight, but it will happen. You young ones are like, what the heck's going on? Ask your mother, she'll tell you all about that. But the great news is that even though this is for everybody, there are so many tools in the toolbox. When I speak to young people, we've found that we're really good at identifying the issues that we have, but I want to encourage you that if you deal with anxiety, if you deal with depression or burnout or anything on the mental wellness spectrum, you can still lead an amazing, productive life. I have a diagnosis of depression and anxiety, and I still get to live the life I live. Some days I have to get every tool out of the toolbox to help me, but that is okay. Like any other health issue, this is just part of my health journey. So let's talk a little bit about what did Jesus say about rest. I'm going to look today about the concept of rest and where science and scripture come together. Because I'm a firm believer that we can find spaces where these things really do complement one another. And we're going to talk about the power of rest this morning. And I've started with this scripture from Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all the things they'd done and taught. And Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and the apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. Now, let's imagine that situation. Jesus was there and all the apostles came back from a ministry trip. Imagine how you'd be feeling. How you'd be feeling coming back from a ministry trip? Fired up. Who's been on a ministry trip? On a trip away or somewhere around? You come back firing. Yes, this is so good. We could go forever. We never need to sleep. Revival is here. We're just going to be awake 24-7. And then they start to fade. And Jesus recognized that even though the apostles came back fired up on all cylinders, his idea was time for a cup of tea and a lie down. I was going to call my message, why Jesus recommends you have a cup of tea and a lie down. Because <laughs> according to this, he did. What he recognized was his apostles were going to get hangry. You know what hangry is? Hungry and angry. Anyone live with someone who gets a bit hangry? You know, they get grumpy. If you just throw them some food, they start calming down. It's great. And so what he said was, they actually need to do this. Now, does anybody happen to know what happens next in this story? It's a bit ironic. So they left alone by, on a boat for a quiet place. Anybody have an idea? What happened? You should know. You're the pastor. What happened? <laughs> The crowd found out where they were going. So this is like the introvert's dream. They're like, Jesus said, let's go for a cup of tea and a lie down. And then next minute, 5,000 people turned up. But not actually 5,000 people, 5,000 men, because they didn't mention the women, because they didn't count in those days. And, um, and they probably had like millions of children, because no contraception. So there were like heaps of them. <laughs> so there could have been like 50,000 people there. So they turned up. So that was a bit ironic that they were going for a break and they ended up following them. But the intention was for them to take a break and actually to find some rest. And I think that's really important because I don't know about you, but I'm a bit tired. Is anyone else a bit tired? There's a lot going on in the world. Why are we all so tired? I'm going to give you two reasons today why we are tired and some things that we can do about it. Firstly, the brain is an energy-hungry monster. Your brain is 2% of your body weight, and it takes 20% of your energy. And if you're doing heavy cognitive thought, it takes up to 40%. This is the reason why when we do tasks that take a lot of thinking, we often come away feeling tired. Give me a nod if you've ever done something with heavy cognitive thought, you've walked away exhausted, and you've thought, I haven't even done anything and yet I'm really, really tired. Our brains take a lot of energy, and when there's a lot to think about, we get quite exhausted. There's a lot to think about in the world at the moment, is there not? There's some really challenging things going on. However, can I also just throw in there, there's some really amazing things going on as well. 
We look at our young people and I feel the sense of people like, oh, they're all falling apart and it's all turning to custard. They're amazing. They are learning some incredible things that my generation didn't know. Their empathy levels are high. Their ability to accept one another is high. And they are looking out for the environment in a way that we never did. I'm excited for this next generation coming forward. Yes, they have some big challenges, but actually they're amazing young people. So let's not write that off and let's not panic. Every generation thought the next generation was hopeless. <laughs> let's be honest. My parents had given up on me years ago, and yet here I am today doing my job. So the brain is an energy-hungry module. It uses a lot of energy. Now, I've got a very scientific picture here for us. <laughs> on my right, ladies and gentlemen, things we had to think about in 1980. On my left, we have things to think about in 2023. <laughs> now, not that scientific. Who remembers the 80s? We didn't have too many things to worry about. There was no... The, the media was pretty small. We didn't know a lot. There's a lot going on that was the same amount of problems. We just didn't know about it. I had two big things to worry about. First of all, could I find my pair of fluorescent green socks? And secondly, would we die in a nuclear apocalypse? Now, to be fair, one of those is quite a big problem, right? Because <laughs> I really liked my green socks. Oh, you were with me there, yeah. But we didn't have a lot going on. It feels like this in 2023, and the problem is it's not an either-or situation. We have added to our Rubik's Cube. We've gone through COVID and we haven't had a situation where we've said, hey, look, you know, we're going to have a pandemic so you don't have to pay the mortgage. <laughs> if only. You know, well, what we're going to do is we're going to have, you know, war in Europe, but therefore you don't have to feed the family. No, it's actually added on. Let's take a moment to reflect, and I want to ask you this question. What's been added to your Rubik's Cube in the last five years? <laughs> If you weren't depressed coming in, you are now. Um, you know, but, but let's be honest, there's a lot going on. And these are the reasons that we feel really tired. And these are some of the reasons that we need a little bit more rest. Now, another reason that we are feeling tired is that because there's a lot going on, our bodies are responding in ways that are stress response. Now, when we go under pressure, our brain has one of four survival instincts. We either come out firing with a fight instinct, a fight response. We either have a flight response where we want to run away, freeze, or fawn. Now, fawn response is where we over-apologize, we take responsibility for things that are not our problem, we actually become a bit of a martyr, I'm so sorry, I'm the worst friend in the world, it's all my fault, it's all my fault. Fight response is where we come out firing. Who knows that you're a bit of a fighter? If I yelled fire, you would be like, here I come to save the day. Who would be our warden? Who would do something about it? And your response would be to stand up and help us out. One person. We've got one. Is there anyone on the balcony who's a fighter? They don't want to put their hand up. because Yeah, over here. All right. She will save your life. Don't panic. All right. We love these people. Some people over here, your first response, if I pushed you to the corner, would be to come out firing. Now, that's not great if I pull out on you in traffic, because you might get angry at me, but it's actually a very normal stress response, and it's actually a really important one, because we do need some fire wardens, don't we? Yes. We've got some people who know. Now, often with stress response fight, we feel guilty when we come out with a fight response, because it's like, oh my gosh, I feel angry and I shouldn't. Your body's just trying to keep you safe. Sometimes we have to fight. Sometimes we have to fight for ourselves, sometimes we have to fight for others, and we have to stand up for what is right. There is nothing wrong with a fight response, as long as it is channeled in the right way. Who's a bit of a flighter? If I put you under pressure, you would just be, where's my keys, where's my phone, let's get out of here. Who knows you would get out of any situation? Yep, we've got one out there, she's running already. No, <laughs> kidding. Who likes to get away from a situation? Yeah, you can just nod, because you people don't want to be identified, because if I identify you, then you'll have to leave. Um, <laughs> When you're under pressure, I am so much this. Under pressure, I'm literally, I've had situations where things have been really stressful and I have literally grabbed my keys and got in the car and just driven. I just want to get away. Often when we get away from a situation, we come out of it feeling guilty again because we say, oh man, I should have stood up for myself. I should have you know, done what was right. But actually, sometimes the safest thing is to get away. Sometimes the safest thing is not to have that argument. Sometimes the safest thing is not to stay in that toxic relationship or that toxic friendship. Sometimes we're better just to duck and run, save our breath, and get out of there. And that's actually perfectly okay. The next one is a freeze response where we just completely clam up and we don't know what to do or say. 
Now, we've all probably had this response. It's like when you go into a meeting. You know, you walk in and you're really prepared, you're going to talk to your boss and you're like, mate, I'm going to tell him what's what. I'm going to give him this, what, that, the other, and I walk in, I'm like, g'day, and he goes, what do you want to say? And you're just like, <laughs> how's work, good? Any problems? No. We do this at restaurants all the time. You know, you're sitting there, oh, this meal's not that great, oh, it's a bit average, you know, oh, I don't really like this, don't they? Then the lady comes up, she goes, how's your meal? Oh, it's great. Yeah, it's really good. You know, no, thanks, fine, no problem. Anybody do that? It's a very Kiwi thing to do. We go all freeze. And then we come out and we're like, oh, what an idiot. Oh, I should have said. So now you write notes. Next time I go, I'm going to say this and this. You go back in. No, I'm fine. And we do that. It's actually a really normal response. We beat ourselves up for this as well. Totally normal. Kids do this all the time. You know when you're telling them off and they just freeze? They just stare at you. And they're just thinking, if I just keep quiet, that annoying woman will go away and leave me alone. They're really, really normal. And that fawn response. Let's have a little look at maybe some, uh, what can we see here? What, what, what response have we got here? What do you reckon? Flight. This chicken's seen KFC. He's out of there. <laughs> do we judge the chicken for running away? No, just saving his life. What about these guys? Pretty cute. Maybe a bit of a freeze response going on. Yeah. Maybe fawn. I'm so cute. If I'm really cute, you won't tell me off. What do we got? Fight. How do we know that the, the cat's in fight mode? Got the paw up. Tails up. Looking big. You know, sometimes we make ourselves big to make ourselves scary in situations. And we go with our voices go really deep. Or they go really high. <laughs> or they, they betray us and go up and down. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe this cat's protecting its kittens. Maybe there's a really good reason why that cat is there. So when we go into stress response, when something is happening, that's tiring. When we come out of that situation, we talked about this last night, when you come out of that situation, when the stress has released, we do feel exhausted. And at the moment, I mean, we literally have this week had news come into our world, which is very stressful, and it will have created a response in every one of us. Some of us would have felt really angry about what happened. Some will have felt like, oh my gosh, I just want to get out of here. Can I go and live in another country? You know, <laughs> You're like Syria's looking great right now. You know, or something, just let's get out of here as soon as we can. Some of you would have felt an absolute freeze, I don't know what to do or say. And those are perfectly normal responses. But can I tell you that you need to give yourself some time to rest when all of this is going on in your world. Last night we talked about the one degree of change. And these are some of the tools in the toolbox that I use to help deal with my mental health. And they all start with a F because they help me remember what's going on in my world. These are some of the things that I use on the daily to help me to process the emotions of what's going on as I deal with and manage my mental health. My faith has been a huge anchor in my world. I, I think of, of, of the boat on top of the ocean and, and it gets moved around by the storm, but if you follow the chain down to the bottom of the ocean, I know that I'm attached to a rock that's stronger than I am. I have no idea some of the answers of what's going on in the world and I'm deeply suspicious of people who say they know because none of us really know. But what we do know is that God has promised he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. I'm still looking for the scripture that says, yea, though verily, it's going to be sweet as. <laughs> if you find it, let me know. <laughs> it's not there. But actually what we can trust is that God will be stable and strong even in the storm. Our whānau, the people that gather around us and help us and support with us, our jelly buddies who walk with us, our therapists... <laughs> Love a good therapist, going, you know, to, going to a counsellor or a psychologist, psychiatrist, people who can help to unravel what's going on in our world. Fullness, if the definition of depression is a dip, and if you imagine a dip in a beach ball, if you try and suck that dip out from the outside, it's going to keep reappearing. The only way to get rid of the dip is to inflate the ball from the inside out. So finding some things that make us come alive. We've got our fitness, we've got our food, we've got pharmaceuticals, great medication that can really help people. I take a, a fluoxetine myself, and if you need to be on an antidepressant for your mental health, do it. If you don't need to be, don't do it. Totally up to you, but if you need to go and see a doctor, I encourage you to go and see one.
They're not a silver bullet, don't fix everything, but can certainly help with the process of dealing with all the other things on the list. Forward focus, something to look forward to, and thankfulness, gratitude. We've already talked about gratitude a couple of times today, and I just love that focus. But I want to give you just two more things, and one of them is around falling asleep. <laughs> because you know what? Sleep is actually a really important part of our rest and our recuperation. In the last few years, actually in 2012, it was discovered that the brain literally washes out this protein as we sleep. Now, it's called beta amyloid. I call it bamyloid because it sounds more exciting. But there is a protein that builds up during the day and during REM sleep, that deep sleep cycle, sorry, just before our REM sleep, a, sp a cerebrospinal fluid literally washes through our brain and washes it away. So we literally get a brainwash when we sleep. Now, this protein is connected with ageing, dementia and Alzheimer's. Now, I'm not going to tell you that if you sleep a lot, then you're guaranteed you're not going to get any of those things. Um, but I'd say, let's say it's worth a shot, right? <laughs> it's worth a shot. So actually having that deep sleep does help us with cellular regeneration, but it also helps our brain. Who struggles with sleep? Who struggles to get to sleep or stay asleep? I've got some really practical tips for you up there. Feel free to take a shot of the screen. And if you look down the side, it says dream. Have a think about your diet. If you struggle to get to sleep, one of the easiest and cheapest ways you can deal with that is having a magnesium supplement. They're like, you can buy them at the supermarket. They are super cheap and literally just taking some magnesium. Try having a banana before you go to sleep. Now, this sounds absolutely crazy, but can I tell you, it really works because they're high in magnesium and potassium as well. So having a banana before you go to bed. If you go to sleep and you struggle to stay asleep, having some protein before you go to sleep can actually be really useful. Have a little bit of like chicken breast or some almonds or something before you go to sleep. Feels a bit counterintuitive, but it can help with that long sleep. Having a routine, the same time frame, heading to bed and doing some exercise. Now, don't be doing like, you know, CrossFit at 11.30 at night, expect to be asleep by 11.45. You probably won't. But doing some exercise earlier in the day can certainly help. Having an atmosphere that's dark, get those curtains shut, not too hot, nice and cosy, can help you get to sleep. And a time for meditation, a great time for prayer, a great time to do a gratitude practice, to take some time to do those things that help to lull us into our sleep. And these are really, really good for your brain. I find this really hard to do. By the way, I'm not up here preaching because it's easy for me. I'm a total night owl. I just want to be up at 2 a.m. watching Netflix, and I have to do this stuff, and it's really hard for me to do, but I do do it. The second one here is called faffing around. I just had to come up with something that starts with F, and this is the power of having a rest and taking a break and getting bored. We do not have a lot of time nowadays to get bored. Now, what happens when we get bored is our brain does a thing called a defrag. Any tech people in the room? computer people. What, is it, what happens when your computer defrags? How would you describe that? Anyone know what defrag is on your, on your computer? Cleans it up. Yeah, cleans it up. What it does is you give your computer a chance to do the filing. Sort of cleans up the files, put them back into place, and it defrags. This is what your brain does when you get bored. You know that feeling when you just zone out? Some of you probably in that now. Please don't put your hand up if you are. You're like, when's she going to stop? I don't know. But there's this thing called the default mode network, the DMN, which is like a screensaver for your brain. And this is when you just kind of zone out. Now, this can sometimes happen when you're driving. Have you ever driven along and then you're like, oh my gosh, how did I get here? <laughs> Not ideal. But it, what it means is that your body and your brain are still operating even when you're in this space. Now, what happens when we go into the default mode network is our brain has a chance to kind of sort through our memories and experiences. It sort of starts to go, oh, yeah, this happened, and I you know, talked to Molly, and she knew so and so on. It helps us create our sense of self, and it gives us a chance to find solutions to big problems. I've got to ask the question, what happens to us if we never get a chance to go into this phase? If we never get a chance to do those things, to figure out who we are in the world and what's going on? And I have to ask you another question, and I'm asking myself, what have we invented to make sure we never go into default mode network? Are you holding it now? I've got mine with me. 
<laughs> is our phones. Now, once again, this is not me going like, ah, oh, the world's going to pop because of TikTok. I don't, that's, that's not true. But if you are a creative, can I say to you that giving yourself a break from your phone, carving out some time to get bored, will increase your creativity. If you like to write or speak or draw or create, or video, or anime, or whatever it is, the thing that you do, write music, give yourself some time during the day to get bored. Because when you're bored, you will actually come up with great solutions. Good things happen in our brain when we get bored. Because what happens is your brain will go off and do some problem solving. When I was recording my first album, I was in the studio, and my producer and I had come to an impasse when he, we, we couldn't kind of get this chorus together on a song. And he was waiting for me to come up with an idea, and I was waiting for him to come up with an idea, and we'd sat there, you know, having that little standoff. He's looking at me like, well, you're the artist, you should write it. And I'm like, well, you're the producer, you should write it. And we're in the middle of this thing. And in the end, he said to me, oh, let's just go for a walk. So we walked out, shut the studio door, went up to a cafe, talked about our kids, talked about life, talked about nothing. Came back opened the door, walked in, sat down, wrote the chorus. So often what we need is a break from the situation and we need a chance. Good things happen in your creativity when you get bored. If you want to have some time for that, I've got at the bottom of the screen, go for a walk. Just a wander. They reckon an uncharted walk through nature is, is the best. But if you can't do that, just a walk anywhere is good. Go and have a, sh have a shower, nice and warm, you know. Who's ever come up with brilliant ideas in the shower? And of course you can sing and then you sound amazing. Because <laughs> that's the acoustics and the steam, by the way. Yeah, and a bit of delusion. <laughs> um, do that. Have a nana nap. Love a nana nap. Sort of up to 20 minutes. Probably not like a two-hour sleep. Because when you do that two-hour sleep, you wake up and it's like, it's like the next day and you don't know where you are and you feel like an angry bear. Don't do one of those long sleeps. But a short micro-sleep can actually really, really help just to do that. I sometimes will have a sleep in an uncomfortable space. So you know, lie down literally, you know, on, on the carpet or something and, and go to sleep just long enough to refresh. Um, do some sports. Something you're really good at already, active relaxing is great to get out and move your body. And a craft. Now, I don't mean learn a craft. Like, don't try and take up crochet to help you relax if you've never crocheted before. You're going to end up stabbing yourself in the eye. It's just going to be, you're going to get angry. But if you already know how to do it, then that can be a good default mode network activity to do as you go along. So I want to finish with this um, with the scripture, and then I am going to finish with the song. In Samaria, Jesus came to a town named Sychar, and Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired out by the trip, sat down by the well. So he came in, and he took a break. He took a rest. When we carve out time for a rest... It makes me think, when did I used to have time for a rest? Used to be when I was waiting for the bus. Especially in Auckland, I'd be waiting for an hour. <laughs> waiting for the bus. Used to be sitting in the doctor's office. You know, you sit down in the doctor's office and there's nothing there except magazines that have been there since 1974. <laughs> and lots of sick people have touched them, so you don't want to touch them. <laughs> and so I would get bored. I'd encourage you to carve out small periods of time for that rest. So Jesus was there at the well and he sat down. Who's, who knows what happened next in the story? I'm sure you all know, but is anyone going to tell me what happened next? Be brave. What happened next? There was a woman. Yeah. So a lady came up and, and spoke to him and she said to him, can you get me a drink of water from the well? And Jesus said, well, I can. Sure, I can meet your physical needs. But I can also help meet needs that are more important than that. I can give you water of eternal life. And not only did he help her with a drink of water, but he actually helped her with a conversation that transformed her life as his relationship with her was created. And she went back to her village and she told everyone about it. She was the evangelist in her environment and she told everyone about it. And she spread the gospel from that one conversation. And my question to you today is, what would have happened if Jesus didn't have a break? What do we miss in our busyness? What conversations could we have if we had put our phone down? 
What conversations could we have if we were just a little bit more energetic because we got a little bit more sleep and we weren't so exhausted and we weren't so strung out and wrung out? Today is not a lecture of what you need to be doing, but today is an encouragement that if Jesus was advocating a cup of tea and a lie down, <laughs> and if Jesus' demonstration was to stop on his journey and to have a rest, maybe we could take his example too in the busyness of our lives. So I just want to finish with, um, with a song that I, I wrote the chorus to during my journey of dealing with my mental health issues. Many mornings I would wake up and I was feeling quite overwhelmed because there's a lot going on and my brain was pretty exhausted. And I used to sit there and think, what can I deal with? I can't really think about next year, next month, all a bit too much. What I can deal with is just today, just one day at a time. So this is, uh, I wrote my own verses for this old classic chorus song um, and wrote myself into it, but I hope you enjoy my version. This is one day at a time. without seeing the sun, but I am confident tides will be turning, just enough courage to take on the day and be grateful for what I can see, just enough hope to find beauty around and your grace that's sufficient for me. Sweet Jesus, he's all I'm asking from you. Just give me the strength to do everything you want me to. Oh, yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, help me today, show me the way. One day at a time Lord help me today Show me the way One day at a time Awesome 